Guess who's back? It is July 5th, 2021, and you are listening to episode 34 of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. What's going on, everybody? Sam Rothstein here, acting principal clarinetist of the Indianapolis Symphony and host of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. If you haven't had a chance yet to check it out, uh, head on over to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash thecandidclarinetist. Recently, I posted a little vlog of me going back to work with the Indianapolis Symphony after 15 months away. I go through my practice routines and even have some clips of some of the concerts we played that week, so uh, be sure to check it out. And while you're there, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Speaking of liking and subscribing, an easy way to support the Candid Clarinetist is to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcasting platform and leave a review, letting everyone know how much you enjoyed the podcast. Also, please be sure to head over to our Instagram at the Candid Clarinetist and like our page. I've been posting a lot of practice videos, performances, excerpts, and uh, we're getting very, very close to 1,000 likes on our page. I really, really appreciate all of the support. Joining me today on the podcast for his second stint, our first repeat guest. Well, I shouldn't say that. I guess Ralph was on twice, but our first one-on-one repeat guest is Michael Wayne, who is the associate professor of clarinet at the Eastman School of Music. And I was confiding to him before we started the podcast that I'm selfishly inviting him on because I am about to try out some new clarinets this summer. It is about time for me to get a new set. And so I wanted to get his opinion and the processes that he goes through when he tries new equipment. And I think that he has a a lot of thoughts on this and and he's very meticulous in his process. And so I just wanted to invite him on and and have him share his ideas with everybody. So thanks again for, for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me again. It's, Absolutely. Uh, congrats on, it's, I think it's been about a year since I was yeah. on, but yeah. congrats on, it's great. It's been fantastic to tune in. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much. So I guess first question, and I don't know the answer to this, but how do you know when it's time to buy new equipment? Like, is there something that happens? Is it just like you wake up one day and you're like, this clarinet's no good anymore. I need to buy a new clarinet. Yeah, so I think with all the equipment stuff, you're going to get a variety of answers. You know, there's some people who have instruments that are 20, 30, 40 years old that they still play. Um, some people switch every couple of years, and then there's everything in between. So um, I think in my experience, uh, it really comes down to what I, I think about with my equipment. So I think about the equipment as simply – an extension of my voice and in my breath when I when I'm when I'm playing, and if I'm finding that the equipment is getting in my way, or I'm thinking about it more during performances, um, that's a sign that maybe there's something I need to, maybe something needs to change, or there's something that's wearing out, or my mouthpiece is becoming warped, or the clarinet has sort of lost its its resonance that it used to have. Um, so I guess it depends on, on what piece of equipment. For clarinets, for me, uh, I felt over time where it just loses its depth and core to the sound. Um, there's various views on this, and clarinets getting blown out. You know, you're going to find a bunch of different opinions. I found playing in the BSO, I was going through B-flat clarinets probably every four years. Wow. And I still have all of those. I have yeah. them, and I go back to them, and they're great clarinets. They're even. They're in tune. That, that didn't go away, but there's definitely more of this solid core resonant sound in my newer setup. Sure. So, and that just depends how much you're playing. I was playing pretty much four concerts a week year-round, so that's potentially someone's entire career in four right. years. So, you know, if you're just playing a concert here or there, a clarinet could last you decades. Yeah. So I was, I was going through them pretty quickly. So. And how do you know when to like isolate what the issue is? So I, I'll, I'll tell you what, what happened to me and, and I've been searching for a new clarinet for like four years and I just like, I can't find anything that I just really love or like really happy with. So I'm like, whatever, I'll just stick with what I have. 
but we played a lot of concerts. Um, I shouldn't say a lot, but the last couple of weeks of our season here, that was all on a clarinet and I have a really good a clarinet, like the sound of it's great and it holds. And then like the next week I went back to my B flat clarinet and I was like, this thing has no, nothing. And so it was sort of that, like I tried something else and that's like kind of what, where I was just like, okay, it's really time for me to do it. So do you, do you notice things like that? Like when you say you notice a change, like, is that the kind of thing that you notice or is it just, you're so used to what it should feel like that, you know, when you're working harder than you should. Yeah. I'm recording myself and I know, I know what I sound like, you know, I've recorded myself so much and I listen back to co every concert I play I listen back. I know what, I know what it sounds like. If, there, if there's a change, honestly, the first thing I think of is me. What am I doing? That's different. If I've gone through all those things and I don't find it, then I start one thing at a time. So I think that's the, one of the big takeaways I'll try to share is that don't try to change everything. You're just going to get into this. Uh, students do this all the time. I guess pros do as well, but you, you start do you start changing everything at once and then you're lost and then you go back like, Oh, I should go back to my, my original setup. And then that feels bad. And then you're just, what do I do? Yeah. So really one thing at a time. I mean, I would start as simple as, is it your ligature? Like try it. And what I do is I always make sure I'm comparing whatever new piece of equipment to what I know sort of works. So let's say, uh, I'm feeling like that my setup is really stuck more like really resistant more than normal. Um, if you just start changing everything, you're just going to go into this endless cycle and to be totally lost. So it could be something like maybe the, the season has changed with your reads. So try a variety of reads. Okay. You're getting that resistance with every type of read, whether it's soft, hard, it's your, then I would change maybe a ligature and just see, is there any difference? Uh, and I do this with my students and most of the time it's like, no, it feels exactly the same. You sort of work your way. Um, it's always good to have a reference point. So if you, if you do play in a section that, well, you can try someone else's clarinet or, you know, when I was in Kansas city, Greg and I would, you know, let me try your setup. Or when I played in Verbier, we used to like switch clarinets and I knew what, like, Oh man, this is my setup's really good. Or I really need something else on my setup. It's nice to have that reference point. Um, so I just going one thing at a time and not just, change mouthpiece, read clarinet, barrel all at once and have this whole new setup. Yeah. Um, so how, it, how do you, I'm sorry, I, I love this, this direction we're going. So how do you, how do you develop that like home base? Is it a recommendation of a teacher? Is it like you just find something and you stick with it for a while? So then you just have this, like, you know what, you know, R13, Van Doren, whatever. Um, like, cause I, I, yeah. You know, when you're, when you're studying, it's like you try everything and then you get lost. And so, go ahead. Well, this is where I, I was thinking about this, uh, yesterday before coming on and doing this is that like, what did I go through? What was my evolution of setup? Um, I think where I was for, very fortunate for my teachers that they pretty much just said, you know, play this setup. I did it. It functioned, and that's another key thing. It's just functionality, not just being, oh, this color, this thing in the sound, or the. You need something that functions. We can get into that more. What is, what is a functional setup? But I had that from an early age, and I was thinking, you know, my first job that I won was pretty much the setup I got when I was 15 years old. It didn't really change. It's not that I didn't try anything. I tried things here or there, and it was okay. It was fine. It was good enough to get my job. And then when I got at the job, I you know, started searching for clarinets and got, I think, better and better equipment. But I wasn't just like changing mouthpieces every six months and clarinets. It was pretty much what I played when I was 15, 16 years old. It was a clarinet I got when I was in middle school. So, yeah. um, so I think having uh, mentors, trusted colleagues that can help guide you early on um, just to get a baseline. So, you know, it's, the setup is not going to all of a sudden you're going to 
double your articulation speed by playing on this mouthpiece. And all of a sudden, you're going to be able to play the Crigliano Concerto because you've got this new player. That, no, there's, it's, it's more about the time you're putting in. You've got something that's functioning that's not getting in your way. And so right. hopefully having a mentor that's sort of that is getting you something functional and recommending things or picking something out for you. And then when you get to a certain stage where you get a job or you get out there and you, you're more comfortable with picking equipment, you can then build from there. Yeah, that's it's funny because I, I and I haven't confirmed this with him, but uh, Ben Lewich, somebody told me that he won his job in Seattle on like the R13 that he had since middle school and like the same Hawkins mouthpiece. Yeah, I so. remember, um, I, actually, it's funny. I'm probably getting this wrong, but Ben was coming through Boston with the L.A. Phil Summit, and we went out for drinks after the concert, and he mentioned that he was on trial for Seattle. I don't think he had gotten the job yet. He was on trial, and that he was on the same R13 setup, and he was on the same Hawkins mouthpiece, but he was really looking for another Hawkins mouthpiece. It had been years. Um, and that Hawkins mouthpiece was when he played in the Kansas City Symphony for, for me, for me, with me. Um, I had gone to Richard, and that was one from a badge I got. That was the one he'd been playing on. It was from mm -hmm. Kansas City. And I said, you know, I have the what I thought was the number one mouthpiece for that badge still in my desk drawer, and I've never played it. So if you want it, you can have it. <laughs> so I... I think it was maybe the next day or something. I, I saw him and I gave it to him. And I, if I'm not mistaken, he ended up using that for the trial. And he, you know, he had oh, the same setup. For it's all because of you, setup. then. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I mean, but, but no, I think it goes to show. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you don't need. It, it, Go ahead. I'm sorry. The, both of us did the same thing. I mean, we were both. I think probably on the same set of R13s and Hawkins mouthpiece when we won our our jobs. Yeah. And, you know, it's. I think. There's so much out there now, so many different types of models and uh, mouthpieces, clarinets, ligatures, that it's so easy to get trapped into, well, this is gonna, this is better, this is better, um, yeah. when you just need to put the time in. And, yeah, yeah. And, and we'll get into that for sure, because I, I, I get a little overwhelmed by that, because there's so, m I mean, you just look at Buffet, it used to be R13, right? Like, that was the, yeah. and now it's like, there's this and then there's this and then there's three models that are all kind of the same but they have different like bells and whistles so yep. we'll get into that a little bit but sure. uh, so let's just go your basic process and I remember you described this once it was during a master class of like how you try a clarinet so say you have a, a one clarinet in front of you that you have to try what is your process and how do you sort of figure out if that's one that you're gonna buy yeah so I would um I'd say there's about four stages from the start to the end that I go through to pick out an instrument. Um, the first thing for me is always pitch. Um, I mean, we can get more into this, but it's really understanding what is adjustable or fixable on an instrument and, and what is not, what is just, just inherent to that instrument that's really difficult to change, or if you do, it's very minimal. For me, it's pitch. Obviously, you can change pitch, but the twelfths, if the twelfths are not consistent, it, every, it's always going to get in my way, as I said yeah. before. Like, I, I want to set up that when I play, I don't even, it doesn't, I, I'm not trying to play the setup. I just, it's, again, it's an extension. And so, the first thing I do with the clarinets is I just slowly play through the 12s. And I look for the relationship of the 12s. So for example, low G and then slowly play the D. Where is the difference on the tuner? Now, I'm probably doing some adjusting. I'm not just pressing buttons. A lot of, a lot of my students, uh, if I don't say that, they just, they play a G and they play a D. Oh, it's 20 cents apart and it's horrible. I, you know, I know at least on, my buffets that I play on, I, I need to support the G a little bit and I ease down the D slightly. I mean, I'm, I'm not manipulating, but I know I have to make some small adjustments. And then I just chromatically go up the 12s. Um, if that's not there, and I would say 
but I have a very high standard of what I would play on. I'm very particular. But I would say that for me, if the twelves are further apart than five cents, I don't play the clarinet. I don't. I don't move forward in the process. And and to clarify that, uh, five cents uh, with within. Uh, themselves. So if like yes. the low G is 20 cents sharp and the, the D is 25 cents sharp, that's fine. That's, fine. that's great. That's actually a fantastic yeah. 12. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where people don't understand that's, yeah. that, oh, I played, I played an open G and it was at zero. Then I played a low G and it was 15 cents flat and the D was 10 cents flat. And it's horrible. Actually, that's, that's, that's really easy to fix. I could fix that in two minutes. Yeah. It, you know, it's just... Uh, by doing some tonal work. Um, so it's just the relative 12th. Yes. Uh, and, and so I, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, to, to clarify for those who aren't familiar, the, the 12th meaning like you play the low octave, push the octave key, that's that's a 12th. Yep. And so it's this the air essentially coming out of the same place aside from the octave key. Yeah, and that's, so I'll that's slowly go through. And over time... Um, and I've played, you know, I've tested and played and owned various makes and models of clarinets over the years. I mean, I've tried so many things. I just, I think if anything, it just gives me confidence in what I play on. Um, but you'll get to know if, let's say you are trying the fake clarinets, there's certain, um, there's certain 12s that are always, uh, can be problematic. And so a lot, like when I went down to pick up my instruments, I went through a huge amount. And so over time I ended up just trying three twelves because all the other ones were all like consistently good, but there was a few twelves that were, you know, some were good, some weren't as good. Um, and that's how I would narrow things down. But that would be the starting point because look, you can, people try clarinets. I, I've sat with people, great players who, they try clarinets, they put their mouthpiece on, they just noodle around, play some excerpts, and um, like, oh, this is great. Well, if I do that and then I go to play it in an ensemble or any musical context and then I realize that the twelfths are way out, the sound doesn't matter. You know, yeah. how f fluid the sound is and all these these more abstract things. If the twelfths are not consistent, it's a no-starter. Um, yeah. And, and, and so that's that's what it is for me. I mean, I it's that seems easy, but it's really hard to find a set of find instruments that are uh, that that close in the twelves. So that's yeah. that's my starting point. And then what's your next step? That's when I um, start playing certain Stuff. musical passages to see, you know, how does it resonate. What is, the, what is the sound that I'm getting? And during this time, I always have a point of reference. So this is why uh, I always try to find equipment when my equipment is in good, in good shape, because sure. I know it works. I know, I know what works and what doesn't in context. And so when I'm trying these things, let's say I play um, second movement of Beethoven six on this instrument I'm trying. I'll then try it on my main setup to see if I notice a difference. Again, you can get really, um, really distracted with um, just this circle of, of trying different equipment and then where are you? You're just sort of floating around. It's always having a stable, I know what this does in context. So, um, so I, a variety of things. So you can do something legato, articulation, something with a large range. Um, I start to play it more. Um, for me, the twelfths take only a minute or so. What is because I've done this so much. Yeah. Um, and then I'll play just something musical to get a sense of it. I mean, I, the best instruments for me is when I start this process. I don't want to put the instrument down. That's when I know. You know, I just want to keep on playing. Sure. That those are the the instruments that okay. There's there's something in the sound. There is a resonance that I'm able to. It's able to help me produce. Um, that I really like. So you've got those two things, the pitch and the sound. Um, I think maybe to talk um, where I said, what is inherent to the instrument, what can be fixed? I don't really pay attention to key work. I don't pay attention to key tension. I honestly don't even pay that much attention to evenness of scale. Because it, um, 
the great repair people that I, I use can fix that pretty easily. You know, if yeah. I, if, um, I don't know, the, the, uh, Shalomo C is stuffy. Well, it's just, it's simply a matter of, you can raise the, raise the, the pad height, maybe add some material in the tone hole if it's then too sharp. There's little adjustments you can make to make it more even. And that's what's really hard with um, a lot of new instruments. They're not really set up to your specific liking or how you, so how do you know, you know, some people are just drawn to a, a well set up clarinet. And this happens a lot where I have, um, it's funny, I have that, this clear acrylic clarinet, the buffet, uh, that I bought for the Boston Pops. <laughs> and uh, last year, like a mill, maybe my first year, in the middle of the winter, instead of taking out my wood clarinet after like biking to work, it's freezing cold, I just picked that up and like demonstrated lessons. But it was set up beautifully. Like I had a professional set up. Um, most students would play that. It was better than their instruments because it was so well set up. It's not the greatest clarinet. Right. So you can't just judge based on, oh, the feel of the scale. And to me, that can be done post-trial. Sure. When I so, get set up. Yeah, so you're just trying to find, like, the inherent issues with, basically, with the piece of wood, yes. essentially. Um, yeah. And mainly starting with pitch, and then it's kind of like, does it do something for you? So once you kind of get rid of the ones that aren't, they don't qualify with the pitch, then it's like, okay, can I, can I play something inspiring on this instrument? And then you yeah. move forward. And this is where everyone is different. Like, what are they trying to get out of a sound on the clarinet? And, you know, the context in which you play, like playing in, playing in the BSO, there's a certain type of resonance that wind section has. And it's something that I look for in an instrument. And so, but that could be different in another orchestra or what surrounds you and how it, it fits in with your colleagues. So that's, that's where it gets a little more um, personal on what you're looking for for sound. And I think that's uh, one of the nice things with all the different models is that you can find slightly different sounds, more cover, more highs, more lows in different, in different models. And that's, that's why there's so many great players who play a variety of setups. So you just not everyone you hear that sounds amazing plays this, 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 and this, yeah. you know, it's, so, and, and then, I don't know, from there, that's when I start to, I would like to, this is if you have the luxury of it, I would then try to get the instrument in a large space. Sure. To play. Yeah. Um, sometimes you don't have that luxury. Um, this actually, I'll never forget, I was, um, I learned this early on when I was offered a clarinet to buy from I teach one of my teachers, the previous teacher, and it was their clarinet. And I remember playing it and I thought it was the most amazing thing I'd ever played in my life. I was just, I couldn't stop playing this thing. It was so even and so in tune. And I brought it to Fred Norman, who I was studying with. I was at Music Academy in the West in the summer. And I was so excited to buy this clarinet. And he said, no, you're not, getting, you're not buying this. And I, said, I, was, and I fought him on it. Um, and he said, let's go into the hall. It was just the recital hall at Music Academy. And he said, I'm going to play the instrument, and then I'm going to play it. At the time, he was playing a buffet or 13. And I did the same, and he listened. And when I went out to the back of the hall, I started to understand what he was talking about. Um, he, he, he felt like up close, it was beautiful. Like if I was playing in a studio and there's a mic right up against me, it would be great but it did not resonate sure like he he wanted me to have and so um i think it is important that you you can get drawn into an instrument in a small practice space but how does it actually work in context in a larger space so having someone out listening record you if you don't have that record yourself again in comparison to your normal setup I think is yeah. really valuable. Um, and then from there, again, if you have the luxury, is to then actually bring it into uh, the ensemble. A, a musical setting. And this is this gets into a whole other thing, but like I would never when I was in Boston, I never brought a new piece of equipment into the BS. I well, sorry. I did once and I will never do it again. I never brought a new piece of equipment into the Boston Symphony. I would always bring it in, I, this is not to downgrade it at all, but I would always bring it into pops. 
because yeah. it was just I was a little more covered there, and it was a good chance to feel like what does it feel like in the ensemble. Um, and so that was the one time in the BSO I actually picked out a new clarinet, a different model than I was used to. Uh, it was maybe one of the most embarrassing musical moments. <laughs> and I, I picked out this instrument. It was so in tune. It was so, you know, it, it was just easy to play into. It was so even. I loved the sound. And I remember it was a rehearsal with Bernard Hightink, and it was Beethoven 9, and he started the third movement. <laughs> just, just second bassoon, second clarinet. Um, and I started playing, and I realized it was not going to work at all, and I did not bring my clarinet, my normal clarinet on stage. Okay. And I remember playing that whole third movement, and I was I, I was just dripping sweat. Uh, because it, it, I was so fooled by this instrument in the practice room. So you have to make sure it actually works on a stage or with others. And, so that's those are sort of the, the the four that I take. I think the most important are that the pitch and then you know playing playing some passages on. Yeah, and here's another question for you: When you're trying a batch of instruments, do you transfer like do you keep the barrel and the mouthpiece the same, and, and or do you play on whatever the stock is for that instrument? It depends on the instrument. Okay. So. So, uh, and this is where it, habit, you know, it, it, this is where it can get confusing. This is where having a mentor or, you know, a trusted colleague to help guide in this, um, cause it can get very complicated with, like with that question. Because for example, if I play an R13 and I use a manning barrel on my R13 and I'm searching for a new R13, I always use my manning barrel. I never use a stock R13 barrel because to me the, tw the for me the twelves are way too wide on the stock barrel. I need the mating barrel to bring it in, uh, bring the twelves closer. So that's what I test them on. But if I use that mating barrel, say on a Tosca, it probably wouldn't work because of the board difference. Sure. Um, or they just and so. For something like that, or I was I was trying a tradition or a festival, I would probably use the stock barrels, and that's where um, maybe you try a new model that you're not used to playing, you, you don't have any experience with, but you use the stock barrel, and it feels really good, and the pitch is pretty good, but there's a couple things that are out. Well, then maybe try some of the barrels that you play on your others, but see if it makes any difference. But have those available. Um, but a lot of the I. Just generally speaking, the stuff I've tried, like from Buffet, for example, um, sort of their higher end, um, I guess they would call it their more flagship models. The stock barrels, I think, are maybe better suited than the R13s are. Um, again, it's, it's all personal preference with that. So I, it really depends. I don't change mouthpiece, though. I'm not like playing a specific. Yeah. I play my normal mouthpiece, my normal read, my normal ligature. And... If I use a modified barrel and I'm playing this, I'm trying out the same model, I use that barrel trial. That makes sense. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And I think it is tricky because it's like, and we'll get into this when we talk about mouthpieces, but I feel like with clarinets too, and I remember this actually when I got my clarinet is I was using the stock. I had, I had a really, really nice prestige that I was trying, and then I had this Tosca that I was trying as well. And this, these were weeded out through a bunch of different instruments this when I was in college and I was using the stock Tosca barrel and I brought it in, tried it for my teacher. And he was like, like handed me his barrel that he was using. And it was just a totally different instrument. So like, that's always been really confusing to me is just like, how do you know <laughs> when you're giving up a good instrument because of like something like that versus yeah, and the, the twelfths thing too is, I mean, you mentioned like the Manic makes the R13 twelfths closer. So how do you know that you're not compromising that when you're trying it with like a barrel that maybe you shouldn't be using on that instrument? Or is it kind of just like try everything? Yeah, I mean, I this is a difficult thing yeah. to answer because everyone's in a different stage. You know, if you're let's say you're in high school or even in college and you're just out on your own trying this stuff, it can get, it's overwhelming. Yeah. 
I mean, I think this is why there are so many services out there that sort of hand select and put things together for people because it is so difficult to put it together yourself. I'm at the point now where I've tried so many setups. I, I just know that when I try R13s, I use my menu room, period. I never try it with even. Um, I actually got in trouble when I was at the buffet. I felt like I got in trouble at the buffet because oh, they put a whole room full of R13s. And I was with one of my students there and I said, okay, you start on that end, I'll start on this end. Let's take off all the barrels. Oh, and I just you put mixed them, them up. Like, <laughs> yeah, and they, they they came in. They're like, those were specifically designed for that clarinet. You got yeah. it all mixed up. I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> I just used my own barrel. Um, but things that I'm not as familiar with, I'll use the stock barrel. If I if I if there's something in there that I like, you know, maybe I'll throw on my the barrel I like and see if it makes any difference. Um, sure. Yeah, and it's – I think on the R13, it does make a big pitch difference or helps the pitch. I find a lot of times with the, the mending barrels on the non-R13s, it actually makes things worse. Or it's – you know, the upper left hand is actually way too flat now. Yeah. Um, you know, clarion left hand. Um, so, yeah, I mean it's – this is where having sort of a template um, – yeah. You know, I don't expect all of my students to play the same setup. Um, I'm happy that they play a variety of models and makes and mouthpieces. But a lot of times it is pretty it's it is pretty easy to just sort of check the box of like this instrument works with this barrel and this mouthpiece and this root. As it's just again, like what I have, I just had a stable foundation. It was functioning when I was starting out. And then over time I just one piece at a time, I got a little better and a little better, more, um, and better I mean uh, not getting in my way when yeah. I play. Yeah, I mean, there's basically no answer for any of this, right? It's all kind of like, yeah. Yeah, it, like you can't, I mean, unless you try every clarinet with every barrel, with every, you can't, yeah. Yeah. but you just have to like. I think the thing, maybe the biggest piece of advice is don't expect, don't ever think you're going to find the perfect setup. I think right. if you go in with that mindset of like, I'm going to find the most in tune, even, beautiful sounding clarinet, you're probably not. There's always some kind of compromise here or there. And so when I'm trying to find equipment, it doesn't matter what it is, read like a true clarinet. I'm just trying to find something a little better. Or like, let's say I'm, I, might, I have my setup now and... I'm finding the starts of notes are a little more difficult than I want. Again, getting in my way when I play. Well, then maybe I'll start with, is it my mouthpiece? And I'll try a couple mouthpieces just to look for, can I keep everything the same, but just a little more ease at the front of the mm -hmm. uh, Not just, I need to get the best mouthpiece ever made. I just want to get it a little better, a little better function. And I think if you, you go around trying to find absolute perfection, you're just going to be disappointed. It, just this constant, <laughs> got to get it better. I got to find the, the ultimate setup. Um, but there really isn't. It's, yeah, it's, just, it's a piece of wood, you know. It's, <laughs> when it comes down to it, it's a natural material that's just going to not be perfect inherently. So. Yeah. Uh, um, so with all the different models, you know, let's just stick with Buffet. You know, okay. do do our duty as buffet artists at least. I'm not, uh, a, I, I'm not a buffet artist. Oh, you're not a buffet artist. I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, let's just stick with buffet because that's familiar at least. Um, so there's, I don't know, ten different professional buffet models. So where do you start? Is it just like let's go, like you like R13, so you're just going to try R13s, or is it you're in a room? There's ten different models. You try every model, and then you narrow down to three models that you like, and then you extract from there what do you do again not to be a, um, a broken record on this but it's it really depends on the individual for me i like to try everything i really like to know everything that's out there i mean this is why i like history and this is why i like it, especially when it comes to music i want to know everything that's ever been done so i can have a very informed uh, confident way to present myself and what i play on what i do musically I'm really interested in everything that's been done or what's out there. Um, that's what gives me confidence. And so when I'm in a room and there's all these different models, I want to try everything. I want to know, especially when students come in, 
or like, what do you think about this type of climate? Well, in my experience playing it, this is what I found. And not just, well, I heard someone play this and this is how they sounded. Mm -hmm. um, so I go through everything. Um, and sometimes I'll find something new that I, I didn't realize this, this is a really good fit for me and I'll, I'll go that direction. For other people, though, that, that can actually be a bad path to go on because yeah. people will get very confused um, and make it just, you know, buy a set of clarinets and then six months later realize they made a, made a mistake. It was not a good choice. So I think it just depends how you are. Like if it's, um, this is why when I try the 12s, it's very, it's, it's not very abstract. Right. You know, I'm looking at a tuner and it's either consistent or inconsistent. And so I do that with all the different models. I don't, I don't care what model it is I play on. I'm not, I don't have allegiance to a brand or a model or I play the best I can find that's for me. Yep. Um, and, uh, and so I try everything and it's, uh, but again, if the, if the twelfths are not consistent, um, or within, you know, for me, that five cents or less range, then it's, it's a no starter. I'm not even going to continue. So yeah. I try everything and it's, it's actually, um, I played the same Van Dorn mouthpiece for years. And when I started teaching at NEC, I decided to go to New York and I wanted to try every mouthpiece that they could release. I mean, it was just, it was so, I mean, there was, there's like, were there like four or five B40s alone? different models like before, oh it's, you even tried liner, like the, the profiles everything. and stuff everything. oh you tried everything okay <laughs> i wanted to know i just wanted to know uh with different reads different models of reads different size reads appropriate reads for each because i wanted i just wanted the knowledge um to know what was out there and not just oh i played a m13 liar and that's I'm, I'm in that lane and that's where i'm staying yep. um and i found for me there was two models that i was drawn to and so I spent more time with those and, but so, but a lot of people doing that would be incredibly confused. Yep. So it really depends yep. on the individual, but for me, I like to try a lot of things and more times than not, I end up at square one back to where I started. Yes. I, 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 that's usually. Yeah. I, I remember I was talking about this with a colleague of mine. He's our English horn player and I went through a couple of those wormholes where I was like, I just wound my way around so many different things because I was, I was having some trouble in the orchestra, various reasons. But um, he's like, you have to have a home base. You you have to have it where it's like you can change one little thing and maybe that works and maybe it makes it a little bit better, but maybe it doesn't. And then you can go right back to where you were. And I just, there was a little while where I just didn't have a home base. Yeah. And and so it's, it's, very, it's a very important takeaway, I think, from this episode is like make sure you always have... A place to go back to otherwise yeah. you're just it's yeah. it's it's a it's a deep rabbit hole very very deep yeah. um so we can kind of skip over bear i mean let's just do a, a barrels okay yeah. um this one will probably be short but you when you try a new barrel so say you have the mouthpiece you like you have the instrument you like uh you're looking to get a barrel like a new barrel because you feel like your Menig is blown out or whatever, whatever the, you know, I, I know you hate that yeah. word, but <laughs> it's, okay. it, you know, whatever it is, it's not resonating yeah. anymore, whatever the case. Yeah. Do you just, do you know, do you try everything again? Do you try like the Hadashas and the icons and all that stuff? Or do you just kind of like go through the Menigs yeah. first? And For me, I know what's, what, what traditionally works for me, uh, you know, so, you know, I've tried some of those, like for example, because you brought them, I've tried some of those icon ones on my setup. They don't, you know, it wasn't good or bad. It just it didn't really do anything for me to switch to. Sure. Um, I tend to just play on many barrels. For years, I've been on Dosh barrels. Both are great. Um, but again, like the clarinets, with all of this equipment, I need to know what's inherent to those pieces of equipment. Like what are they? What do they consistently do? What is the inconsistent? aspects or feature of those for me um, and so I don't really find big differences in pitch like if I go through a batch of 66 millimeter medic barrels the pitch is pretty similar 
Yeah. It's not like one is all of a sudden my 12 are wide or really narrow. It's pretty consistent. Yeah. Um, it's the same thing with like, let's say again, because we, we've been talking about it, Pandora mouthpieces. I don't put on an M13 liar, M15, B40 liar, I go through 10 of them or something. And all of a sudden, one plays at a completely different pitch class. Like the yeah, they're pretty similar. Consistent. Um, so for me, what I'm trying, I would say the biggest thing, just because we don't have all day talking about this, the biggest thing for mouthpieces and barrels is very similar, is that I need a balance. And the balance I need is ease of response, immediacy of response. Um, I would say on a side note here, I would, I would say the hardest thing about playing in an orchestra is when a conductor gives you a downbeat and you have to be there. So you, you can't have, I can't have something that's just, I have to grab uh, to make the sound come out. Just open G, absolute ease of embouchure, and it just, the, the note comes right out. It's very easy to respond. So is that the first thing you do when you try new mouthpiece? Just open G? All, I mean, it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all I do. Um, because with what I play on, that's the inconsistent point. And so sure. that's all I'm testing for. Everything else is there for me. The response isn't always. But there are, there are setups, but there's barrels and mouthpieces that are the opposite. And so the balance point is the immediacy of response and then what some people would call, I don't know, the blow through. So you, when you put air through the instrument, the positive resistance you encounter in the setup. So you have something to blow against. You don't want to fight it, but you need something to hold the sound. And so I'm trying to find the ideal balance of those two things. And the equipment I currently play on for barrels and mouthpieces, for the most part, have that positive resistance. What's inconsistent is the initial response. And so that's what I'm looking for. But there, again, there are other setups that are the opposite, that they're, they're easy to respond, but they don't hold once you put air through it. So gotcha. it's sort of knowing what you're trying and what's inherent to that piece of equipment. So that's what I look for in the barrels. That's what I look for in the mouthpieces. Yeah. And, as an and initial while, choice. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and while we're on the mouthpieces, uh, at least with Van Doren mouthpieces, it's really funny because I feel like they won't, in my experience, I haven't gotten them to work the way I wanted them to unless you have like the exact right cut of reed and the exact right strength of reed. And so how do you go about, so say you're, you know, so when, to use myself as an example. So I was having trouble, I played on a B40 lyre basically ever since I knew you. And I was just having trouble in orchestra with that response. Like it was inconsistent with the response and it didn't matter how many of them I tried. I just, I couldn't find a response that I liked. And I tried different cuts of reeds. Everything was like too hard or way too soft or it didn't have the hold, whatever, blah. I had some other pitch issues. Anyways, I had a lot of issues so you could tell. <laughs> but so then I tried these BD fours after they came out and I was like, perfect. Like this has the response, but it took me a good three or four months to figure out that I needed a much harder read on it. And then I felt like I finally had something. And so how do you like, again, how do you figure out like what's the, the equipment and what can be fixed? Okay, so I remember years ago, I was with uh, a colleague in front of mine going through equipment. Uh, and I've gone through so many cycles of mouthpieces. I mean, I have a collection of vintage mouthpieces, modern stuff, and everything in between. Um, to me, the best mouthpieces are the ones that function on any size read. So for, for an example, and I know this is, this sounds like, oh, I've never had anything like this. And this is why it's, you know, I, I've taken years searching for a setup that works really well for me is that, um, I used to play on a close mouthpiece. I've moved to sort of a medium open mouthpiece. So like M13 Lyre versus B40 Lyre. They take different reads. You know, I I play on a V12 three and a half plus on the B40, I play on a four V12 on the 13 line. But even the, like if I put a four on both of them, I can still get initial ease of response. Even though ultimately it's probably gonna be a little too 
resistant on the B40, I can still get that ease of initial response, even with too hard a movie. Um, and so on all the, the few mouthpieces I have that I think are really, really good are barrels too. Even if the read cut isn't ideal, this test for me always works. Now, you might have to go through, you know, I know you said you went through a, a lot of B40s. And, yeah. Um, a lot of them don't do that, honestly. A lot of no. mouthpieces don't do that. And that's where it's, um, it's hard because you can find mouthpieces that do have that initial response, but then they don't have the positive, what I would call positive resistance to blow against. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you're, I'm always, trying, again, going back to this balance. I need that balance of ease of front and the hold, and it's holding the sound as I put air through the instrument. And, so. and you, they are super inconsistent. And I mean, just to give an example, I recently had like a batch of eight of them of the BD4s, and seven of them were completely unplayable. Like they just wouldn't. <laughs> Uh, it was, it, and then the one is beautiful. It works great. Okay. So it, it well, just... the, the, the interesting thing though is, and I, it, it's an easy thing to complain about with equipment. Like, oh, I tried 20 instruments and they're all, they're all terrible. Well, <laughs> I've learned where, um, not everyone is looking for the same thing you want. Right. Yep. And the other thing just to, I, I think an important thing to, for people to realize is that, Maybe one of those in that batch does not work with a Tosca and your ligature and your, your entire setup, but it works really well with someone's R13 or someone's Yamaha. Yep. And because, and I think this is something I learned much later on that I think it's really important to understand, it's all about how the equipment works together. Um, just, I know we're running low on time, but oh, the, no, um, that's one quick story, this is where, where I realized this, is that I remember we were in New York playing some concerts and I stayed with Mark and Jim. And, you know, the, we woke up in the morning and we went through, the, you know, geeked out with clarinets and mouthpieces. Um, I played his full setup, he played my setup. It felt totally, it just felt fantastic. Just the, the resistance, the sound, uh, but I remember I took my mouthpiece and I played his clarinet and it was so resistant for me. Mm -hmm. It's like, how do you, how do you play this thing? And he, he did the opposite. And it was like a kazoo. On my clarinet. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what I realized is that the clarinets I was picking were incredibly free blowing. but I was, I controlled the resistance point of the entire setup with my mouthpiece and reading. Yep. And he had the opposite. He had more hold in the clarinet with a little more freedom up top. And so, yes, you might think that, oh, those, those mouthpieces are garbage. Well, maybe they just don't work with your setup. And that's, yep. that's another thing that young players especially don't. They have a hard time understanding because, well, I heard this player and they're playing on uh, XYZ and I bought that, but I don't get that sound. Well, you know, they're playing on different reeds and different clarinets and barrels and how it all interacts. So I think that's important to understand. It's, you're finding what works for you and your entire setup. Yeah, and, and the concert hall and acoustic you have to play in as well definitely makes a big difference. Uh, one last question if you have if you have time, yeah, if sure. you, you have to run. Um, yeah. So I had a, a, a listener ask if you should still kind of try to poke around with different equipment if you're like satisfied with what you're playing on. I know you do. Um, sometimes but yeah i i would say overall i'm very satisfied with my setup there's nothing that if there's something if there's an issue it's me it's something that i'm not doing in my practice you know it's i'm not i don't really blame blame my setup yeah. um but i do try you know van doran came out with a different ligature i try um okay. And I try if I if there's something I have access to to try to see is it any is it a step forward for me if my is it make this any better um, so I do try things but I'm not actively like ordering trials of instruments because uh, I'm not really at a stage to start looking for something new um, but if you know that you easily get confused and you're at a point where you're content you know 
maybe take it easy. I mean, there's there's people you hear of who just play the same setup. I mean, I, uh, I might have this wrong, but, but uh, Craig Nordstrom in the VSO, I mean, he played the same Van Doren Diamond Perfecta bass mount piece his entire career in the VSO. Wow. You know, it, it never, it, people are switching mouthpieces all the time. And he just played the same mouthpiece, though, and he sounded great. Yeah, um, he's good. So it's, uh, you know, the, the one th- equipment thing I always go back to is a story that Tom Martin t- told me, uh, and I'm paraphrasing probably some of these aren't even paraphrased, so I, I'm probably not getting it totally right, but I, he, he would tell me the story of Al Genovese, who was the uh, former principal of the BSO, and after a concert, someone in the orchestra came up to him and said, Al, I your read was amazing, it sounded amazing to me. And he sat there and he took the read and he put it up to his ear and he said, oh, I don't, I don't hear anything. <laughs> and that, that always got to me. That it was, yes, it's, it, it, maybe it was a good read. So it helped him, you know, play a certain way or, um, but it's, it's, it's the individual that's making it. Yeah. yeah. And that's so great. I think if you, if you understand that, um, you don't get so obsessed about just getting the right absolute right setup uh, so and again it's just it's making sure it functions it responds it holds when you put lots of air through it um, and pitch you know yeah. if, if the pitch isn't there and you can't um, you, know, you can't easily adjust to get things uh, you know relatively in tune it's it's always going to be a struggle yep well awesome this was a great uh, sort of equipment buying guide what to look for and and what to you know certain things that you can that you can use to be more discernible when you're trying new equipment i think the most important takeaway at least for me is just just reiterating making sure you have that home base and something that you're totally comfortable with that you can always go back to and you know and the other thing is too don't don't change more than one uh, variable at the same time otherwise you're you're not getting a, an equal equal test of everything so thanks so much michael it's always just a pleasure to talk with you and 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 pick your brain with all your fantastic knowledge and uh, your students are always i always envy them i'm sure they're very very lucky to be at such a great school with a great teacher um once again be sure to drop by our instagram page at the candy clarinetist or our website at candidclarinetistpodcast.com my name is sam rothstein and thanks for tuning into the candid clarinetist podcast